The American football is one of the most iconic balls in all of sports. The ball, commonly referred to as the pigskin, is actually traditionally made out of cowhide leather for professional and collegiate levels of competition. The process of making these cowhide footballs is referred to in the industry as fabricating a ball, and it started and remained a very simple process, one that has been essentially unchanged since 1941. The ball is made from four panels of leather, which are obviously checked for gashes and then weighed to meet specifications. Interestingly, the leather has all come from one sole distributor since 1941, Arnold Horween and his manufacturing business, the Horween Leather Company. Horween was a former NFL player and coach who struck up a deal with the NFL way back, one that has obviously paid dividends for Horween and his family who have supplied the NFL and Spalding ever since. Those are some pretty good accounts to have in your portfolio, huh? Anyway, after those guidelines are met, reinforcements are added and then the panels are hand sewn together. It's then inflated to 80 PSI so that the stitching and shaping can be examined. And if it passes the inspection, the football is stamped with the NFL logo, deflated and shipped out. The process is even simpler for the production of youth footballs, because most organized youth leagues typically use footballs that are made out of rubber or a variety of plastic materials. But nonetheless, the pigskin designation has lived on for quite some time now, and although the sport isn't nearly as old as baseball or soccer, it has been nearly a century and a half since the first game of American football was played. And just like the sport has evolved from its run-heavy, hard-nosed style of play to today's version of football, which is very much geared towards passing-oriented offenses, the football has gone through its own evolution. The first football was used way back in November of 1869 at Rutgers University in New Jersey. This was so long ago that the forward pass, which was implemented in 1906, hadn't even been legalized yet. It was in fact so long ago that even the officials had trouble keeping the ball inflated. The ball lost its shape so many times that play was stopped repeatedly and the players had to take turns blowing the ball back up. Originally, the inflation issue wasn't quite as pressing as you might imagine because passing was quite literally irrelevant in that iteration of football. The first ball was round back then, almost like a soccer ball. This made it very tough to carry and even more challenging to throw. In 1874, the ball was transitioned to a more watermelon shape of ball, similar to a traditional rugby ball. And while laterals and short flips were much easier and becoming a mainstay of the game strategy, throwing the ball any sort of distance was still too challenging to be common. There would be no alterations made to the ball for the next 30 years or so. That is, until 1912, when collegiate football implemented a new set of rules that completely transformed the game, and the ball as well. It went from a cumbersome watermelon-shaped ball to an oversized version of what you see in today's game. And that was how the ball would stay until 1935 when the NFL shortened the ball's dimensions and decreased the amount of air that the ball could hold between 12.5 and 13.5 PSI. This iteration of changes to the ball resulted in an increased emphasis on the passing game in the NFL because the quarterbacks could actually grip and toss the ball around much more freely. The change in play style led to a new generation of quarterbacks that started to enter the league. Players like Sling and Sammy Baugh of the Washington Redskins, who was widely referred to as the NFL's first great passing quarterback. As the emphasis on passing grew, the NFL continued to try and develop a football that was more suitable for throwing downfield. Their production partner, Wilson, used a number of different innovations, like hand-sewn ends, triple lining, and lock-stitch seams. Attempting to revamp the throwability of the NFL footballs, for lack of a better word, led to an era of experimentation for the burgeoning league. In 1956, the NFL approved and implemented white footballs for one of the newly introduced night games. This special night game football was supposed to make the ball easier to track through the sky during the night games. While the white football was short-lived, it resulted in a change that I can only imagine many people visualize when they picture a standard football. Two thin white stripes that trace the diameter of the ball just short of the end of the football. Ah yes, finally the white stripes. The stripes that you probably think you see on every football. And there is a reason that this falsity still remains a truth in so many people's minds. It's because at most levels of play, but not the NFL, these white stripes actually do appear on each end of the football. The lines are typically halfway around the circumference and serve to improve nighttime visibility, just like the NFL tried to back in the day. Not only did the NFL use the white striped balls up until they were banned in 1976, they even featured it in one Super Bowl. That would be Super Bowl VIII between the Minnesota Vikings and the Miami Dolphins. 
following the Super Bowl, the NFL began to phase the ball out, deeming the white stripes unnecessary considering how bright the professional football stadiums were able to light up the playing field. So the NFL chose to begin seeking alternative options for its game day ball. Wilson, the company that supplies the NFL and most colleges with their footballs, then made a variety of prototypes for the NFL to examine, including one without stripes. The NFL evaluated and decided it wanted to go ahead and implement the stripeless ball. The powers that be felt like the use of a stripeless ball would help distinguish itself from the business of NCAA football. Wait, what? Yeah, despite the countless rumors that the changes were due to players losing their grip on the ball as a result of the white stripes, this is the truth. It's weird that the NFL felt the need to do this. I mean, the NCAA is not the only organization that has used striped balls. In the CFL, the stripes traversed the entire circumference of the football. The disbanded UFL used a ball with lime green stripes, and a ball with red, white, and blue panels was introduced in the equally defunct American Indoor Football League and its successors, like the Ultimate Indoor Football League of the early 2010s and the Can-Am Indoor Football League during its lone season in 2017. The XFL, during its first go-around, used a novel color pattern, a black ball with red curved lines in lieu of stripes. This design was actually redone in a tan and navy color scheme for the Arena Football League in 2003. It will be interesting to see if the XFL reboots this design when it resumes action in 2020 or if they come up with a brand new scheme. But when you consider the original nature of the NFL and the NCAA's football's relationships, it starts to make a little more sense. In the early days of professional football, and the NFL in particular, college football was king and playing professionally was not something most players necessarily aspired to do. At that time, it was more important to try and secure a good job and make sure you can earn a living. This is an undeniable truth of the early eras of football. I mean, take the case of inaugural Heisman Trophy winner Jay Berwanger of the University of Chicago, for example. After winning the Heisman in 1935, Jay was selected number one overall in the NFL draft. But rather than sign the contract, he took a job at a rubber company and coached part-time at his alma mater. Can you imagine a player being selected number one overall and turning it down? To work at a rubber company, no less. The first player to win the Heisman Trophy and play in the NFL didn't come along until 1938. That would be Davey O'Brien, and he only lasted two years before leaving to join the FBI. Granted, it probably made financial sense at the time, which is a huge motivator for why people pursue careers in professional football nowadays. But still, it is crazy to think about. The truth of the matter is that college football was way bigger than professional football at the time. It was to the point where there was a legitimate stigma about being a professional football player then. Listen to how former NFL player and football historian Mike Oriard describes professional football during that time period. Quote, Professional football was out there as an option for former college players who didn't have anything better to do. It was a depression, and if you didn't get a job right out of college, you might play pro football for a couple of years." End quote. That is quite a departure from where professional football stands today in the echelon of professions. When University of Illinois star Red Grange joined the NFL in 1925, a deal that was scandalously arranged while he was still playing in college, it was considered a huge black eye for Grange and really all parties involved as far as the college football elites were concerned. And perhaps with good reason. Every year, the NFL champion would play an exhibition match in August against a team of college all-stars, and the college players won six of the first 17 matchups and netted two ties. So all of those, could Alabama beat the Browns or the Dolphins, or insert terrible NFL team here debates, those were actually real back then. And the crazy part is that the college teams could beat the pros, it wasn't until the AFL entered the fold and salary started to skyrocket that being a professional football player started to become more appealing. And while that was bubbling, the NFL was actually starting to gain some traction among working class fans in big cities that hosted franchises like New York, Chicago, and Philadelphia. The league did exceptionally well there because those locations were strangely not very well represented in college football. As the NFL continued to grow, college football, particularly the people who were making money off of it, started to see the NFL as the opposition and essentially trying to keep the league at a distance. This started a Cold War-type period where the two leagues jockeyed for position in the eyes of the viewing public. Eventually, the NFL took over, in part because the NCAA and college football had so many rules and regulations that capped how effectively their games could be marketed. Things like rules that limited how often the premier programs could appear on TV, amid worries that it would provide a recruiting advantage or impact attendance, were eventually what allowed the NFL to completely overtake college football. 
and in turn, the level of playing professional football shot up. After 1963, the NFL champions would never lose another game to the college All-Stars. In fact, it got so lopsided that the game was discontinued in 1976. So needless to say, things were not always as amicable between the two entities as it is today. And that's what sparked the NFL to continue to differentiate, even in the smallest ways possible, like whether or not to feature stripes on their footballs. And that is the crazy history of the evolution of the football. The changes started off drastic and became more minor over time, but each iteration is uniquely tied into the growth and evolution of the sport itself. If you're new here and you haven't subscribed yet, feel free to click the subscribe button down below. If you liked the video, then like the video, we'd really appreciate it. And last but not least, don't forget to tune into TPS every single day for more cool videos.